Thanks for coming. My name is Jeremy and... I'm Sharon. Yeah, we're from Imba Interactive. We're a sound design company based in Singapore. So uh, we do music, sound design, voice yeah. and implementation. We can explain yeah. a bit more. And yeah. um, let's show you some of our pictures of our studio. Okay. Yeah, this is our music suite. It's where I work. This is um, a place where we smash things and record things for different games. This is the mixing room. And then another session of our co-founder who's sitting there. Yeah, you might have seen her in the panel just yeah. now. Yeah. And she's, this is a real yeah. uh, session where she's mixing um, sounds for games. Yep. And this is uh, actually um, like we're playing a game real time and real time mixing the audio for the game. So the, the game featured here is actually uh, Masquerada by Witching Hour Studios, which we'll bring up a couple of times later as an uh, illustration for the, the voice examples. Right. So as we mentioned, uh, we have... Today, um, <laughs> basically this is four things that we focus on. Uh, it goes really deep uh, in terms of uh, many other things, but today we'll focus on... Voice. Voice. So, okay, before that, why, why do we talk about voice? Uh, because, um, okay, well, let me show you about our vocal booth first. <laughs> this is where we work on uh, some of the voice talents that we work off. I uh, record uh, very talented people here as well as non-humans as well. <laughs> okay, so why, why do you want to bring up voices? Because in the past few years, we've been talking a lot of uh, Audio 101 talks that covers uh, music and sound effects. And I mean, being in Casual Connect, we see a lot of indie games and we find that um, the usage of voice in games is really uh, underexplored. Um, developers tend to be in intimidated by it, either being not sure how to go around, go about working with voice talents or basically uh, our budget issues. So, I mean, today we're going to share a bit of, of uh, just to show a, a really a lot of video content to give you ideas on how you can maximize the concept of using a voice inside your game. Yep. Uh, yeah, let's move on. So, the first thing we're going to talk about is actually giving a voice to the game and... Uh, well, the video I'm about to show you is actually a lot of games with that announce their titles at the start of the, the press start screen. But uh, in the, the first video is going to be without the voice. And then the second one, the, the what it actually is, and, and you'll, see, uh, you'll see the difference. Alright, like, let's watch what they were meant to be. Yeah, so I mean, uh, you can see from the examples that most of these are actually uh, arcade games. Um, it's, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, can't, I find it a pity that it's, it's not really used now in mobile games a lot, where actually it's very doable, right? Um, in the case of Daytona, without the gentleman's start your engines, it's just like, uh, it's like any other racing game, right? But everyone remembers that voice for being from Daytona USA, the game. And, and it doesn't really need to be the title of the game. For example, like yeah, Daytona again, right? That screen is not the main screen, but you know the usage of voice there is really strong and it really anchors the brand in the minds of players. All right. From giving a voice to the game, let's move on to something else. How we can use voice as well um, is to provide feedback to players in-game. So Sharon will share more about that. Okay, so basically... Voices are used in many ways. So the next few examples that we're going to show you is information and voices that are given to the players. Let's take a look at the video. Bomb has been planted. We have captured the control. 
Divine. The aerial faith plate in here is sending a distress signal. You broke it, didn't you? Work complete. Finish him. Yeah, so you can see from the games there, a lot of the voices that are used in all these games give a lot of information to the player. If Take, for example, uh, Metal Slug. If there wasn't a machine gun voiceover behind it, I, I don't think it would be the same. I really like Metal Slug because of the voice. And also, when you play it, it's so fast-paced. There is no time to actually look at what you've gotten. The voice gives you the information straight up, straight up in your face. And you can move on without looking at the, the visuals. So in a way, um, you fit the information straight into the face of the player without them having to scramble, look around. And for Porter, I'm sure a lot of people know Porter, right? You love that AI and you get like really competitive yeah, because of what they say. <laughs> it's humorous in that way. Without it, it just feels like another puzzle game. Yeah, without GLaDOS, the whole Porter experience is just like, uh, yeah. A, yeah. Just a puzzle game solving problems. Correct. The entertainment value is much less. But actually, also, GLaDOS guides you along during the game. So, it has a sort of a dual function. Correct. And then for, like, Street Fighter, uh, I mean, we take the Hadouken very for granted these days and it, yeah. we feel like it's a, it's a, like, oh, it's, it's Street Fighter. But it's true. If you think about it, there's tons of characters that shoot fireballs out of their hands. But because of Hadouken, it makes what Street Fighter, uh, Street Fighter. Yep. So there's a sort of branding and information as well. Character attachment. Okay, something more recent. Uh, take Overwatch, for example. Right, we all know that game has very uh, good sound design. There are whole articles, whole videos on it. But uh, we're going to narrow in on just, just the presence of voice. I mean, that we take very for granted. Um, so this is a video done by Chris Brett from Eurogamer where he makes a comparison between... Uh, uh, be, you'll see a before and after. The before the, is actually a session of Overwatch without voice from the characters at all and with a sort of a badly mixed audio. That means you hear footsteps equally as loud as everything else. And the, the second one is uh, what it should have been. Yep. And in comparison, here is the same clip, but with those systems in place. This is what Overwatch actually sounds like when you play. There's a gigantic difference. Hi! Contact! Yeah, so as you can see and hear, it, um, the voice now, only through this example, it's really clear that the voice not only just fills up the soundscape, but gives a lot of information, like the position of your enemies when they get hurt, especially in a map that is uh, slightly darker like this. You know, did you actually hit your enemy? You, you hear the hurt sounds and when, when different moves happen, you know, it's really important. Even the high at the beginning, the moment you can feel the game is very different. It feels much more interactive. Yep, so... From this, we'll move on to providing voices to characters. Yep, and Sharon will take over. Yep. Yeah. So we've, we've touched on information and voices. Mm. So now we'll touch on giving a voice to a character. Voicing your characters. So what about voicing your characters? Is it about language? Or is it about tone that we're talking about here? You know, before we 
go into more in detail. Let's look at a video. I'm sure some of you have seen it before, but just, yeah, let's I'm... just enjoy the video. What's this? Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, hold on. Who's, hmm. Who's this? Okay, all right. Who's that? Right? This one. Who's this? Okay. Don't don't corner. Don't whisper. Okay. Who's this? Toffee. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. How about this? Mia. <laughs> oh man. Man, I can keep going. Uh, who's this? Toffee. <laughs> okay. You might not know this one. <gasps> Who's <That's> that? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this? Uh, okay. Yeah, you guys get a picture. It's like wow. I don't know how the boy does it. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so I'm assuming yeah. that everyone knows Pokemon Go, right? Is there anyone that does not know? Yeah, anyone Pokemon? hasn't seen this game before? Okay, if you okay, have not good. seen them. <laughs> Yeah, it's time know. to wake up. <laughs> but but anyway, Pokemon Go, if you notice, the sounds that they use, mm. they are very intentional about choosing what sounds they use. You know, if you look at the graphics inside Pokemon Go, it's actually very high definition graf graphics. Why did that then use voices that are, you know, synthesized? Well, because they were reaching out to their old fans. Yeah, the Game Boy and stuff. They already have a history of like Pokemon. And they were actually reaching out to their whole pool of old fans that were loving it and waiting for it. But does it mean that you will lose the new fans? Not really. If you look at the video, the boy obviously is born a after. boy. <laughs> and, yeah. But he can relate to Pokemon because of the tone. The character is still there. Mm. And when you talk about having a voice for a character, it's not necessarily about a language. Mm. It can be something that is... Something else, like gibberish. So, with that, Jeremy will talk about yeah. more about gibberish. So, in the case of Pokemon Go, uh, yeah. the voices are more like Sharon mentioned, synthesized, because also it was from Game Boy systems. Yeah. The, at that time, those hardware had no capability of recording human voice and reproducing them. We move to something more human again. Okay, but again, I love this game, another case of, it's actually a puzzle game, as, you, as you'll see later, um, but... The human, the, the, the voice gibberish that they use uh, actually adds quite a bit to the game. So you may watch the video first. Okay, um, so you can see actually the, the whole music track and the art style sort of have that sort of has that uh, quirky factor in this game because uh, you know uh, you, you, the, 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 you have to solve crimes and find out clues at the end of the day, but uh, what yeah, but what you the, the, the voice um, what, what it actually does is in the puzzle screen, if you remember, there were very small silhouettes of people that you encounter, right I mean visually that's a really tiny icon, but because of the voiceover. You can hear it, some of them are male, some of them are female, some of them are young, some of them are old. It actually helps build the, the world around another case of and like the, the whole story. Yep. Actually, there's so much voice work in this, but I can't show them all in one video. So do check this game out. Yep. Yeah. So from giving voice to characters, we move on to something a little bit more uh, traditional, which is uh, narration, giving voice to story. Yep. Yep. And I'm going to touch on one of my favorite games, and that is Bastion. Uh, has anyone heard of Bastion? Yes, show me your hands. Like, who has played Bastion? Very good. <laughs> right, Everyone right, connect, has touched I mean. <laughs> on Bastion. Why? Yeah. Why do I like Bastion? Because Bastion is very special. They use... The whole game is crafted around narration. 
without narration, you can't go forward. Everything, uh, instructions, tutorial is all around narration. And VO is the biggest feature in this game, not only for this particular game, but there are other games as well. It's their identity. And it not only gives you clear direction and information, it is so immersive. The players are stuck on the voice. It feels like somebody's talking to you throughout the whole game. Yeah. Without, um, let me show you a video hmm. on the game. Proper story is supposed to start at the beginning. Ain't so simple with this one. Now here's a kid whose whole world got all twisted, leaving him stranded on a rock in the sky. He gets up, sets off for the bastion, where everyone agreed to go in case of trouble. Ground forms up under his feet as it point in the way. He don't stop to wonder why. And then he falls to his death. I'm just fooling. Finds his lifelong friend just lying in the road. Yeah, pretty cool. Later, we'll actually see a bit of how uh, Darren Corp goes around recording the video for this. Yeah. But in summary, okay, the upside of actually using voices in your game, it can actually create a more immersive and you know, deep portrayal of the story because of the familiarity of human voice among humans. Okay, it also can create identity and personality for a franchise. For example, when you announce the title in a certain way, in a certain voice, immediately your, your branding for a game much stronger than just being visual. And also as a means of feedback, as you've seen in, in as a lot of in-game, uh, especially FPS and, and uh, shooters. Of course, there's a downside to that. I mean, you don't just like buy... St voice is not something where you can just get off stock. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, poor voice work can really take the immersion out of the game. So, there is a, it's like a dual edge sword. So, obviously, and also you have things like uh, localization. Um, as you can see, in another case solved, they actually use gibberish. So, games like The Sims and all that. It solves the problem of uh, localization a bit so that they don't have to do translations and, you know, it costs money or that every time you uh, go to a different market. But yet, you still want to include a form of vocal. So, that's a good solution. Right, so from here we'll move on to talk about how to work with voice talent because like I said in the start, uh, that's the, one of the most intimidating points for some developers when I speak with them. Okay, so um, yeah, there's no one right way to do it. Uh, there's several ways to get voices or engage voice talents. Uh, there's so many ways. You can actually go into the studio in you know, a traditional way where with your voice talent, uh, with your... Uh, game designer, producer, or you can hire a voice talent that is uh, from overseas and they can remotely record it. Or you can have a mix of both where you're actually, your voice talent is not where you are, but you are guiding them over, like uh, last time you used to call it ISDN or nowadays it's just VOIP Skype. Yeah, all right. Or any other sort of uh, program. So there's three main uh, stages that we want to break down to. Uh, Pre-production, production, and post-production. So in pre-production, two main parts. You have to craft the script, right? I mean, uh, yeah. I've actually heard of cases where people just try to get their talented friends uh, as actors and say, uh, can you improvise based on this bad idea? Or even yeah. the script out of the boy's talent. Yeah, yeah, you, that, that's yes. a no-no, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's right. So I mean, you need to have direction for the very, very minimum. So you have to craft out a persona Okay, um, give it, whether it's a character or just a voiceover, okay, you need to have directions. Uh, of course, the basic things like age, gender, uh, if you need a specific accent, you know, these are yeah, the main technical stuff. Um, yeah, so, okay, let me show you all of it first. Yeah, so you need to have a casting document and a script. You need to ask yourself truthfully, um, can you write a script on your own? Right. If you're not good at writing, seriously, just yeah, be honest with yourself. Get some help. Yeah, hire a writer, or if you know a friend that is a writer, beg him to do it for, or for whatever you can afford. You know, or you know, that's one part. And then audition actors, uh, where you can, which means try to get some choice before you nail down on one actor, uh, or at least work with someone you trust and you can communicate with. And then when you do audition the actors, listen out for their ability to perform rather than some guy having a cool voice. 
or like, oh, I, I'm, I need a low sounding male for sure. I don't care if he can't express what he wants wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We shouldn't go for that. Yeah. So almost always a good performance can trump, uh, uh, just a good quality voice. Yeah. And, and then if you don't really know how to do that, if you can get a voice casting director. Right. So, um, okay. Here's a sort, sort of an actual script from, remember the character Oli, uh, I, I mentioned. Um, I'm oh, sorry. I didn't. Okay, sorry, this is a, <laughs> the character from, from Masquerada. Um, my next slide, you'll see how it looks like, but this is the script. So at this point, I'll, I'll get Sharon to try and read the lines in orange. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Vuel, uh, geese, please. Just, just try your best. Trehari, leg, dom, duil, leg, dom, a fleece. Anyone want to try? Okay, never mind, never mind. In the interest of time, yeah, we don't. Yeah, okay, so um, as you can see, it's some kind of foreign language and uh, when you just pass someone a script like that, uh, read it, it's not going to do any help. So you need to give pronunciation directions, you need to know how it's supposed to sound like the tone, right? And uh, of, of course, the luxury is that all of the characters in the script actually are present in the same studio, but most of the time, it's really tough to get that to happen, either logistics-wise or budget-wise. So here's the script. And then you need to provide, if you can, a picture. For example, this is the character. Uh, we, there was Faye in the script, but his actual name at the end is he's called Oli. All right, and he's voice acted by Jacob Burgess. Did I get his name right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, this is how it sounds like at the end of the day. Don Sivnia, Santa, Atva, A Sam Bel Ia, Sen Athavuil, Tugok. Yeah. So that that obviously is not Jacob's voice. Uh, naturally, okay, because this is not a human character and, and you can see he's, he's really tiny. So when we go into post-production, I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, so let's move on to production. Okay, the when we move into the studio, um, you need to get your script ready, I already mentioned all that. Okay, make sure you are already very ready before you enter the studio because studio time is precious, costs money, costs time. And... Uh, the worst thing you want is a voice actor in, in the booth without direction. Okay, um, yeah, um, what else? Okay, yes, um, the other factor is where do you want to carry out your voiceover recording? Do you really need to be in a studio? Uh, can you afford it? Do you have access to such services? Um, you know, uh, if, if you want to record remotely, do you, is your script simple enough to just hand over to the voice actor and then like say you email them directions or stuff like that or do you really need to talk over the phone or, or Skype you know consider all these factors yep yeah. so the second part would be schedule it's very important to plan ahead like what Jeremy talked about it's all about pre-production planning and before you even have the session have you talked to your talent? Like what Jeremy says, do you need to call the talent? Have you gone through the script with the talent? Are you even familiar with the, the, the script? That's very important. You are the director of your own movie or here in this sense, your game. So it's very important that you're on the same page with the talent. And you are hiring someone that can act. You don't expect him to act like you because you're not the actor. But you have to respect the actor who's going to put more things on the table than what is expected because he has that talent. So when you talk to the talent, when you get on the same page with him and you want to make him comfortable because at the end of the day, when he bounces off ideas with you, he's going to give you more than expected. And who knows, maybe your character development may come from him or her. So be open-minded to suggestions and you know, get the best out of what you can. Yeah. Yeah, and sorry, I missed out one point, which is during the recording session, um, try and just involve the sort of bare minimal amount of people. Yeah. yeah um, we don't need. Uh, you don't want extra opinions in the recording sure. session as much as possible. Just the main decision makers, because, uh, yeah, the last thing is over the talk back. You, yeah, your your voice actor is hearing an argument on the other side of the room, <laughs> or they're just standing there. What's going on? You know. Yeah, it's bad. Don't want that. It's not that we're yeah. saying that you can't have a yeah. group of people inside the studio. But be ready before but the... Be no, know that all of you are on the same page. Don't go in and tell, oh, I think this character can be like that or that yeah. or that or that or that. Yeah. The talent wouldn't know what to yeah, do. Yeah, so the next video yeah. we're going to show is actually 
uh, Darren Cobb with uh, recording Logan Cunningham in from his, Super Giants. Yeah. Uh, for Bastion, and you can see very clearly how he gives constructive stage by stage. Very specific keywords yeah. to their voice talent. Yeah. This, which is a video. Oh, uh, okay. The context for this is you're going to be hearing me on my talkback mic from the other room. You're going to be hearing the audio from Logan's mic. I apologize for the dimness. My closet. Uh, well, it's a closet. So. <laughs> Great. So let's. Um... Let's make it happen. Yeah, we're rolling. <clears throat> well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Give peace a little bit more importance. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Watch the plosive on the P. Yeah. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Great. Now, um, a little bit more like pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Um, try to imply a little comma after well. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Give it uh, the well, a sort of like, well, what do you know? Kind of, well, what do you know? Mm -hmm. That kind of vibe. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Great. Again, just watch the plosive. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. One more time. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Flatten it out. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Flatten it out even more. Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. I like that. One more time. Well, what was that? <laughs> Well, he somehow makes it back in one piece. Cool. Cool, yeah. So so you can you can actually see the, the, the whole relationship between the director and the voice actor, right? It, like sometimes uh, Logan will pause a bit before he starts performing something. And uh, you can hear how Darren Cobb is actually giving a thought before he says something to Logan as well. Just to give you all context, yeah. the relationship between them, oh, yes. they are... Like childhood friends. Yeah, friends, roommates. So they're very close friends where they can actually talk to each other in a very comfortable manner. Hmm. That's why it didn't seem awkward for his good like voiceover friend to like repeat and talk again and talk again. In hmm. in a real uh, scenario where you meet somebody, that, somebody that's new and then you're building a relationship, you need to actually encourage the voice talent because the voice talent doesn't know your expectations. Hmm. Yeah. Right. So another setting... This is actually uh, what, uh, one of my projects and uh, the, the reason uh, I, I run an own sound studio and I'm recording a voiceover overseas is because for this project, we require a Tibetan VO, which, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we just can't find a Tibetan voice artist in Singapore or anywhere near the region. Now, the irony is actually we found an actor over in, I think, Atlanta, yeah. So this, here, here's, here, you know, we're, we're doing the session over Skype. And we're giving real-time direction after each take. Yep. Just to show some contrast. So next video I'm going to show you is an, uh, another... It's like a triple-A game, triple-A titles. Voice actors who are veterans. Yep. yep. So this is for Arkham City. Kevin Conroy as Batman. And then Mark Hamill as Joker. One of my favorite uh, behind-the-scenes voice acting uh, footage of all time. So. Batman Arkham City is essentially a character-driven experience. So the most important thing is to have the right voices for those characters. Working with Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy is fantastic for us. Like most people, you know, when you read the comics, these are the voices you hear of Batman and Joker. So, yeah, it's very hard to imagine the game without them. 
Batman isn't just this steely-eyed guy doing some rooftop dropping down, making the odd, you know, quip and then punching people. You know, he's going through hell. You're not safe here. No one is. Kevin would come in and go, no, I don't think Batman would quite say it like this, or no, this is how I want to say this line. And we are like, OK, cool, awesome, <laughs> let's go for it. Don't worry about me. You're needed out there. I've been doing the character now for 20 years. The audience knows him as well as I do. They would know in a second if I did something inauthentic, and they'd call me on it. <laughs> Get out of my way, Quinn. Leave us alone, B-Man! I said move! <laughs> when you see Mark uh, become the Joker when he's actually in the recording booth and doing these voices, he actually physically kind of twists himself and manifests himself into Joker. <laughs> Mark, sometimes I think he actually is Joker, so he just turns up and he just nails it. In fact, we rewrote all the dialogue to really fit into where he was taking Joker. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> you fell for the old sick Joker guy, Batman. Yeah, yeah this video is so awesome. You should go and search it and wa watch more of uh, Mark Hamill doing his stuff. It's, uh, yeah, I never get sick of it. Okay, well, I, yeah, so I mean, what, what we're trying to illustrate here is, you know, you, you can see how even the voice actor can affect the script. So like I said at the beginning, there's no one right way to do this. It really depends who knows the character better. And this doesn't change whether you're working on an indie project or a triple A project. Okay, this, it's just the scale of things, but the, the method is, is pretty much similar. All right, so very quickly, post-production. Yeah, so you would think that after recording your voices, that's it. You can put it in your game. But no! You need people to help you clean up your stuff. Things like, you know, sometimes when you speak your saliva, you know, when you talk to one another in real life, you don't hear it. Our ears are very good at cancelling all these things. But when you record it, it's very clear. And if you put it in as it is, you might be hearing saliva sounds, popping sounds, whatever that you want is there. So... You need somebody to come in and then clean it up for you. Mm. And that basic editing delivery will actually give your game a, a more polished look. And filtering is also in the picture. You can't expect your monster to sound like a normal man. Okay? In, in most cases, monsters don't sound like humans. Okay? So you need to process your sounds, you need to process your voices. Unless your game is about a monster that speaks like a human, then okay, you, you can pass that on that. And integration, mixing. A lot of people understand that it's very important to put sound, voice, music inside. But what about mixing? Having level sound. If your music is very beautiful, your sound is really cool, you record it from scratch, but everything is in your face and your voice, even if you record it well, you can't hear them, then what's the use? You need a good person to go in to balance everything, the music to be in the background, the sound to come out when it's supposed to come out, the voice to be heard so that information can be given. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, so like, do you want to share the Masquerada experience? So for Masquerada, yeah. you know, uh, in their case, right, they had 500 page script. Yeah, the script's yeah, like right? over 500 so pages. So we, yeah. we didn't record the voices. We worked with another studio in America. Mm. And then... You know, 500, script, 500 pages of script. You can't exactly fit it in a 24-hour studio time. It's crazy. You can't expect the actor to act you can't 24, stay hours. Away for 24 hours. Even in Hollywood, you, you're not expected to do that. Yeah, so you have to separate sessions. You have to plan ahead. Maybe a week or so or two weeks or even a month mm. to record 500 pages of script. So in that sessions, in all these sessions, you know, Everything can change. Every session can change. The audio engineer might not be the same person that operates, you mm. know, the machine. Yes. Um, the microphone may not be the same. Yeah, or might be slightly off yeah. the previous the, day the, position. The, the, yeah. A voice actor might be not standing in the same direction, position. He might be, in the first session, he might be standing closer to the mic. The second session, he might be standing further away from the mic. All these things matter. And... We come in, like, this, this part of the, the, the production would be Q, QA, 
and then making all the sounds, all the voices are consistent in leveled. And for natural, so that yeah. they sound natural in game. Correct. So when we yeah. were mixing Masquerada, a few audio engineers were inside the room. One mm. was playing, I was playing. My other um, co-workers were uh, one was do dabbling with uh, middleware, trying to level everything. Then one was writing notes. So when I was playing halfway, some of the voices would come out very loud and, and it would shock me to death. Yeah. And so... Or sometimes that, it's too soft and we just... Hey, pause, pause, we pause. Hear. We need to write notes. Correct. Because when you're playing the game, you, you might not be really focused on the just the audio mm. aspect. You, you mean you need to play the game, right? right. And you'll be visually distracted sometimes. Yeah. yeah, so there's multiple people. So then we have to yeah. take out again and then we have to level yeah. everything, hear through everything and then, then put into the game again yep. so that everything would be nicely done. Okay, so speaking of uh, Masquerada, right? So, yeah, filtering. Okay, so we're back to Oli, the character. I'll let you hear how he sounded like originally. Don Sivnia, Santa, Atavach. And this is after we did the post-processing. Don Sivnia, Santa, Atavach. Yeah, so we, you can see we, we actually pitched him up a little bit, did some filtering, so it sounds less human, right? And then there's another character called the Lady, which is uh, literally just the orb down there. Okay, so of course, the, it's a human voice at first. You did it, my child. And then we do some filtering to it. You did it, my child. Yeah, so it sounds more like uh, omnipresent and uh, holy-ish. Yeah, so yeah. In summary, okay, um, in pre-production, yeah, craft the script and persona that's actually useful down the road, okay? Not uh, craft something draft and expect that it'll work magic after that. And then prioritize performance over the type of voice, I mean, the, and over the voice quality. And in production, you just, always... Yeah. You need to be very prepared in terms of script, understanding yeah. your script, um, talk to your voice talent, go through with your voice talent, even before the meeting, so that everyone knows what is on the script and what is supposed to be performed. And studio time, you know, if you don't plan well, then you will have to go back again and then the budget will increase and then everything will screw up. So, so be prepared to be so prepared for uh, in the pre-production stage. Yeah, and most importantly, be open, be comfortable with your talent, make your talent comfortable with you as well. Yep, and in post-production, yeah, we just covered, it's really important, especially for games. Yeah, so... Don't under-budget uh, time and resources for this. So, yep, that's it. Go out and make some voices for your games. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone has any questions. Uh, let me start by asking. Yeah, sure. Uh, I am part of an indie game development studio. Mm. Uh, between me and my collaborator, we have worked on more than 100 games the past yes. 10 years. But these are small browser and mobile games. Yes. But uh, we have never used voice mm. because as you wrote in your session description, the usual reason applies to us, lack of budget, or we have minimal budgets for each game. Mm. So could you give us a rough picture uh, regarding the economics of using voice? Ah, games? I see. Okay, um, there, uh, I mean, okay, Let, let's begin um, from, let's see, remember the Pokemon Go example, right? So like, the concept of having a voice to your character is not just, not, not necessarily you have to record a voice talent. Right. So right there, if you have a sound designer, try to urge the sound designer to actually make a voice for the characters. I mean, that's already the simplest with the current resources you have. And when you start to have uh, voice talents, um, there you have a, quite a lot of options out there. Um, either you can use someone in the office, right? And uh, they are, like if you saw Darren Cobb's recording session, I'm not, not sure if you caught from the video, it actually was in a closet. Yeah. It, yeah, because it was his first game that he worked on, actually. I mean, he worked on other things, audio, but... His of course, first he, was, game, yeah. he was an audio engineer. Yeah, so yeah. he knew, like, if he recorded in the closet, what kind of voice he would get. Yeah. He definitely was the QC person as well. Yep. So, Jeremy said that you can actually approach a sound designer. You never know, maybe he is interested mm. in making... It's also sound design as well. Yes. Yeah, it may not necessarily be a language mm. where you speak it out. It could be something that is filtered to give character to your voice, mm. and your sound designer could jolly well be able to do it. So yes. the most important thing is to tell him and ask, or, or mm. for all you know, maybe he will be the one that will look for mm. the voice for you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, voice talents, okay, then when you go to the other spectrum of hiring voice talents, um, you, you can either look for one uh, online, some of them have their studios, uh, where, they are yes, where they are located. Yeah. 
So, I mean, these, I, I, there's no definitive thing. You can, it's so simple. You can just search on the net and you can find uh, tons of like, just search voice actor, whatever. And then you actually can find their contacts and their rates, whatever. I think the most yeah. important thing is that at least you get, mm. you need to know what's qual- quality voice mm. and what's needed for your game. Yeah. So, if you go to a home studio, it doesn't mean that a home studio would be bad quality. Their rooms are still treated. So, they might have um, yeah. very good quality voices too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to, sometimes it's a bit of trial and error. Yeah, I mean the same with working with artists. Sometimes you hire based on their reel and then you meet them in person, you realize oh, maybe the, the reel was a bit of a lie. I don't know. Or, you know, it takes him a lot of effort to get his best. Sometimes, or, or just a mismatch of creative direction. It's, it's, it's a really a people thing. So you have to, to work at it. And uh, yeah, there are, there are, I mean, to, there are cheap ways to do it. There are expensive ways to do it. So yeah. When you are asked for a quotation on mm. price, so how do you give a rough estimate rega- uh, in terms of number the of seconds industry, maybe? Or how do you do it? The industry for sound design and voice and or music mm. is very different. So for voices, it's like... Um, I asked I ask, I ask about the breakdown, the components, if you were to add voice. Okay, so there will be the studio recording time. And then the, the voice talent, they, are usually, they usually charge per hour or by length of script. And then there's the post production. If you need like complex filtering for your voice, then that's as usually additional uh, fees for that. Yeah. So all these yeah. three segments are all specialized. Mm. Different people that are working on it. Mm. And then even within the voice talent industry, they all are have different rates according mm. to what they have done before. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of demand and supply. It's, it's really hard to pinpoint uh, their on their rates. Correct. Yeah. Better shoot an email to you then. Yes, <laughs> okay. please. Specific <laughs> things. Okay. So okay, I got a bonus clip here since it's the last session and it's you know the last session of Casual Connect. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Check it out. Is it playing? Okay. <laughs> I can't. I can't hear you. Press the button. I can't hear you. Press the button, you donut. I can't hear you. It's Clem Fandango, can you hear me? Yeah, obviously, if you press the button. What's your problem? You've only worked here for three years. Temper, temper, Stephen. Don't you temper, temper me, boy. Just do your job. Okay, Stephen. Now, the client was very, very specific about the style of the read and the pronunciation of some of the words. Clem's got it all in front of him. We'll take it from here. Right. Hello, Stephen. This is Clem Fandango. Can you hear me? You are a fucking star, aren't you? Yes! Okay, so this is important. The client has expressed that he'd really like you to... Oh, fucking hell, you've done it again, you cunt! Press the button! I can't hear you unless you push the button! Stephen, this is Clem Fandango. Can you hear me? I dare you to say that one more time. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, well, then keep your finger on the fucking button. I didn't catch a word of that, all right? And I need to hear again exactly how that client wants me to say this script. Okay, Stephen, so this is important. The client has expressed they'd really like to stress certain words within the script. Okay. And the words he'd like you to stress are love. Yeah, so that's a clip from Toast of London. You can check out more on, on YouTube. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.